It's been called a prank, but really, a prank? How about an outrageous, aggressive sexual insult hurled at mostly women reporters while trying to do their jobs? This is where we're at in 2015? What does that say about us as a society? Margot Goodhand is the editor-in-chief of the Edmonton Journal, and she's in the Alberta capital tonight. Robin Doolittle is an investigative reporter with the Globe and Mail. She's in Ottawa. And here in Toronto, Jeet Heer is a contributing editor for The New Republic, and Marissa Nelson is the senior director, digital media, CBC News and Centres. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, this. All right, I know what you're thinking. This was a disgusting moment, but how often does it really happen? More often than you might think is the answer. Screaming a particularly sexist, obscene phrase at reporters doing live hits became a thing after a fake episode went viral in January of 2014. In the near year and a half since, there are now millions of views of dozens and dozens of examples from many different countries, all available online. And if you must hear what's being said, then that's where you'll have to find it, because you won't find it here. The offenders seem of all ages, raising the question of just how typical being confronted by this and other sexist behavior is for women in our business. Again, more typical than you may think. This brief survey of our network brought these results. When I first started in sport as a, you know, three decades ago, uh, you didn't say anything because if you said something, uh, you probably be perceived as being weak, not able to handle the job, so I didn't say anything at all. There has never been a time where obscenity shouting has not been part of my experience in the field. Someone yelled at me, nice beaver, and uh, that was my first experience in uh, a professional locker room. It starts out with maybe something fairly innocuous like you're beautiful or marry me um, and then eventually that escalated to a point where this man thought that he could kiss me while I was on air. I hear lots of personal comments instantly and of course there's no filter. People go to their smartphone or their computer and they immediately tell me that they don't like that today and it's quite something. It's as though people are trying to outdo themselves with their negativity to try to be um, more clever uh, more cruel than the last person. I was on the streetcar, and it was a long ride, so I'm sort of checking Twitter, and I noticed that there was someone who identified themselves as a fan of my reporting, commenting on what I was wearing and my body, and then it quickly became apparent that this person was on the streetcar with me. I was outside the ACC with my cameraman. We were getting ready uh, to go live. We probably had only a few minutes before the live, and um, there was a group of men behind us, and they started catcalling. And one man in particular um, started to get very personal. He said, hey, you, in the whatever color coat I was wearing, you know, nice ass, I want to you in the ass. You've never had it so good. Um, you won't believe it. He went on for a long time, and at first I just sort of brushed it off. I made a joke of it with my cameraman. I let it go, but it just kept going and going and going to the point where... It, it felt like... <laughs> this doesn't happen in a vacuum. We're never alone in these circumstances. Why hasn't anyone else stepped up to these people who are flinging the vulgarities and said, that's not appropriate, it's not funny, it's never been funny, and it's not cool? All right, there's some uh, pretty stunning stuff here and a lot of questions raised by it. So let's try and talk about it. And Margo, why, why, don't, you, why don't you help us? begin by trying to answer the question, what's really going on here? How, how did we get to this in 2015? You know, it's, <clears throat> it's hard to handle after that, um, to get glib and talk about how far we've come. Uh, but it was only just a century ago we were fighting for the vote and to be persons. So, I, I, you know, women are moving into the workforce in greater numbers than ever. Any profession is available to us. We are better educated than ever before. We are uh, moving into the boardrooms and running our own businesses. And yes, I think there's a backlash. I think there's a tremendous backlash. I think the, the women's shelters are more full than they've ever been. You build one and they get full again. I think the misogyny in pop culture is as strident and as sexist as it's ever been. And um, yeah, now we've got misogyny as meme. How cool is that? 
So yes, there's a backlash. A backlash? Robin, uh, do you see it that way too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what's so interesting about this effort right in the P thing that we've been talking about is that it, it contrasts these two things that we're dealing with as a society. Um, this, this feminism issue, misogyny, and also this um, fear of being publicly shamed. Um, the, you know, the Monica Lewinsky TED Talk, the book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, and we don't, uh, you know, necessarily like people losing their jobs over things like this. But in this case, these guys are, are willingly stepping in front of a television camera and putting this this trolling out there and it's hard to feel sorry for them. It's hard to explain why someone would do something so stupid other than getting caught up in like a bro culture, I guess, where you're trying to out frat boy the guy next to you. Jeet, how did we get here? Well, I, I think it's definitely the backlash explanation is right, and uh, the bro culture is very much a part of this. It's often like a gang of young uh, men who are uh, sort of competing for each other to prove to themselves. But I, I think, um, although this sexism has always been there, in a lot of ways, social media feeds into this. That you know, if uh, w uh, once this becomes something that's on YouTube, then other people want to copy and imitate it. I think the sort of comment sections on all sorts of websites have broken down the barrier between people, and they've sort of normalized abusive behavior, uh, behavior and abusive language on sort of you know Twitter uh, and uh, in, in newspaper comment threads. You see like all sorts of horrible sexist stuff all the time, and it's become uh, um, much more socially acceptable. You know, Marissa, you hear and you've heard already all through this, you know, social media is like a partner somehow in what's happening here. Is it? Uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think there has always been vandalism. And, mm -hmm. and what's motivating these, these people, I don't think misogyny is motivating them. What's motivating them is to be a vandalist and to have people see their, their you know, their vandalism. Um, what, where social media plays into it is you can have a worldwide massive audience instantly in a way we've never had before and it's evolved so quickly that we haven't kind of come to an agreement as a society of, of what's okay and what are the norms and, and, and what, what are the consequences of that kind of behavior. Um, Having said that I don't think misogyny is motivating them, what I find particularly offensive is that it, they, they are saying these things as if, as if it doesn't matter, that it, that it is just funny. They aren't actually thinking about the consequences of this vandalism and just how offensive it is. I, I, I am wondering, though, what it says about us as a society. Because, you know, G, you talk uh, about the kind of people that we're seeing uh, involved in this. And I think, you know, for the most part, when I first saw this going on, I thought, oh, you know, it's, it's young guys, they're drunk, they're coming out of a soccer game or a football game, and they're out of control. But, it, you know, it's not just yeah. young, drunken guys. It is, as we saw last week, this is, you know, it's young to middle-aged professionals who are involved in this. So what does it, what does it say about our society, Margot? I think, I think, it, it, I think it says that we are required to stand up about uh, to stand up against this kind of stuff i think that a, a lot of it is a bro mentality that um that, but what what disturbs me most about what happened in that one particular episode is just that, that they thought it was so funny and i think you know blackface used to be funny i think there were uh, there's lots of things that used to be funny racist jokes that used to be funny that we have to that because social media is sanctioning or nurturing this kind of hey this is a funny joke and everybody gets it nurturing and really furthering that perspective, uh, then you're going to get people who get out there and go, well, how come you don't get it? I get it and all my bros get it over here. So there is that sense where somebody has to at some point say, well, no, it's not socially sanctioned behavior. We don't think it's funny. And, you know, until we speak up against it, that's that's what it's saying about us. We're, we're, we're complicit. You know, Stephanie Matisse made the point that, you know, it's not like it's happening in a vacuum. It's actually happening with a lot of people standing around watching it happen and saying nothing. There's this kind of silence uh, in the crowd. Robin, what does that tell you? What, what I thought was really interesting about that video, which I'm, I'm sure you've all seen, is there was this group of guys at the beginning, and then as soon as they were all kind of like chuckling, like, this is going to be hilarious, and then once they realized that, wait a minute, we're getting called out on this stupidity, a couple of them 
kind of looked at each other and turned their backs and walked away because they had a moment like, oh, no, wait, I'm not an 18-year-old frat dude. Um, I think that that's kind of basically what people need to do. The major There are jerks well, out there. There was only one person who called them out. And that was that reporter. I mean, there's this crowd standing yeah. around. Gee, right. a, the crowd is watching, and, and nobody's sure. doing anything, whether it was that example or others. Well, because we have all these excuses that we use, like, oh, this is a joke, you know, lighten up. And uh, uh, in the opening clip, we saw that. Like, you know, um, women themselves are sort of told, well, you have to take it as a joke, you know, like, don't make an issue out of it. And so we've actually, as a society, we've socialized ourselves to, like, accept this, and that has to change. It, it actually reminds me uh, to when I was an education reporter in London, Ontario, and I was often interviewing Barbara Coloroso, who wrote the book about the bully, the bullied, and the bystander. And she talks about how bystander ha bystanders has, have to speak up. They have to say something. And I also think, uh, you know, in, this, in the case uh, that we saw last week, it, w it was a fantastic case where the woman was actually standing up saying no. That, that's actually not enough. And I'm sure I certainly remember many cases when I was a young reporter interviewing powerful people and the answers are sort of pat, pat, they're there. And you don't intervene, even in that case, you don't say anything because you don't want to be part of the story, you're covering the story. So I think part of it is uh, we all have a responsibility to speak up and speak loudly. But I also think we need to empower young female journalists so that they feel that they can be like the city TV reporter and actually call people to account when they behave that way. All right, we gotta take a break, but I wanna pick up on that point when we come back with this question. Will highlighting the extent of this situation lead to change, or will it only give incentive to more of the same? When situations like this happen, for me, I'm raising two girls and I want them to be strong and I want them to be fearless and I want them to live in a world that's accepting of that and, and accepting of whatever they choose to do in their lives. Welcome back to the Media Watch. In the discussion tonight, Margot Goodhand, Robin Doolittle, Jeet Heer and Marissa Nelson. Well, if those two little girls are going to grow up into that world, things are going to change. How are they going to change, Jeet? Well, I'm a big believer in punishment. Like, I actually think uh, in this, you know, in this most recent story, it was actually a very good thing that uh, the perpetrators are being punished and shamed. And I think that we have to actually, uh, as a society, learn to speak out and, uh, and to empower uh, young reporters, as uh, was mentioned. Punishment and shaming. Margot? Yeah, we, have to, we have to expose behavior that they think is okay, that they think is, 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 is appropriate, and we have to expose it and say, no, it's not, and we have to show it for what it is. Robin? I think what you need is, is people to stand up and say, hey, your boss is going to see this. Uh, do you want to deal with that on Monday morning? And hopefully that'll shut some people down. You know, I, I was talking to a, an executive in town the other day about how he dealt with job applicants. He said he no longer looks at resumes. He goes to their Twitter account, mm -hmm. Facebook, whatever he can see of them online. And he makes decisions about them on that and tells them in the interviews, I don't look at your CV. I want to see what you're saying online. How do we change things, Marissa? I think there do there does have to be consequences, real um, consequences, um, and people have to take notice. I get, uh, I'm nervous about whether we can actually affect change though. And when this first started happening, I was worried that covering it would actually embolden the people to do more. Um, and so, so, so that, that troubles me. I'm worried that because, you know, so these videos get many, many millions of views, that that will just be a self-perpetuating um, system. My hope is that by public outrage and real serious ongoing consequences for this type of malicious behavior, that that will in fact um, lead to change. You, Again, Peter, we yeah. have to remember how far, I mean, you have to remember the change has been so massive. Uh, my, grade, my grade nine history textbook was called Man in His World. And I have a female um, leader of my province now. I think things are changing, they're just slow. But, it, but does it not seem at times that things were changing and things like this turn it the other way? Things like that. Shauna Hunt, though, stood up and said, this isn't cool. And it's, we're, it's almost a week ago now and we're still talking about it. I, I really do think that this is sort of one of those moments 
um, that has the potential, at least in this country, to shut that down. And certainly it was one of the most uh, viewed stories we had uh, last week. Three days running, it was in the top three. So I think pe it, hit a, it hit a chord that perhaps Absolutely. people weren't expecting. But was she that chord provoking comments in the comments section? Uh, of support of for support? Shauna, absolutely Huge for support. yeah for support. There was there were still a very small subset of um, jerks who were being jerks, but there's always jerks in society. <laughs> but the vast majority were certainly supporting her and and the stand she took. Jeet, give us a, a closing thought on this. Well, I, uh, I have worked in education, and I always think that when something terrible happens in the classroom, someone says something really bad, you don't turn away from it. You turn it into a teaching moment. And I think that that's what's happened here, that uh, a horrible thing was done, and uh, Shauna turned it into a teaching moment, and that's what we have to continue to do. All right. We'll leave it at that, and we'll see, because I, yeah. uh, I got a feeling this is going to provoke more discussions from us on subjects like this. Uh, in the future. So thank you all, Margot in Edmonton, Robin in Ottawa tonight, and Jeet and Marissa here uh, in Toronto.